a revolution digest where businesses get smarter. I'm Jesslyn. And I'm Elias. Together, we show you how AI drives real results. And because the future isn't waiting, you have to dive right in. There's a few things in life that exist before you and will exist right after you. Some people say it's God, while others would say taxation. And today's episode, we have a very special guest here today to talk with us in what ways are we going to tax the future in a world of AI. And now let's welcome our guest speaker for today, Mr. Christoph Springle. Sir, thank you for being here. Can you tell our listeners who are you and what you do? Yes, thanks uh, for inviting me. So I'm Christoph. Um, I'm a professor at the Business School of the University of Mannheim, which is right in the middle of Germany. And I I'm the tax man in, in, in my, my faculty and I'm 60 years old now and um, I also like to teach and uh, the contact to Jaslyn and Elias is about the International Business Education Alliance, one of the best bachelor programs in the world and I'm one of their teachers actually in Mannheim. My main interest is on international taxation global tax reforms, but also innovation and digitalization and, and, and taxation. And that relates to today's topic, which is about the impact of artificial intelligence on taxation. So I'm happy to discuss some things with you. Thank you, Professor. So you talk about you're very interested in AI and its innovation. So one of the things that's trending nowadays is cryptocurrencies and NFTs. I think that's something that people of my generation are very interested in. However, given their volatile and decentralized nature, in what ways do European countries plan to tax these assets? Yeah, that's a, a very relevant topic because, uh, say, a cryptocurrency, whether we have uh, Ripple or uh, uh, Bitcoin, is not an official uh, currency like the euro or the US dollar. And um, in particular, say for uh, complex tax structures, um, as far as I know, some uh, have already implemented cryptocurrency, say to use that for uh, intercompany loans. And uh, for instance, uh, we have um, most European tax systems um, have so-called interest deduction limitation rules, you know, to, 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 to um, um, limit um, profit shifting. Um, however, that only holds for um, uh, official currencies and it does not cover cryptocurrencies. So uh, it's, it's really an open issue. And um, it's also a bit an open question, what type of asset is a, is a receivable in a cryptocurrency. How do we evaluate that? Uh, what what, what you, you mentioned, um, you know, the fluctuation mm -hmm. of, of, of the value, is that a capital gain? Is it a capital loss? Because um, it's not yet sure whether this is a fixed assets or an intangible assets. So a really interesting topic um, to, to, to work on also in a kind of, you know, scientific papers. Thank you very much, Professor. So talking about taxation in the future and the forecast of taxation, what trends in AI-driven taxation do you foresee shaping the global tax landscape and how should businesses prepare for this future? Yeah, um, this is um, a very interesting question. And um, before um, we had this uh, interview now, I, I made up my mind a bit. Um, what are the, the topics um, um, where taxation meets AI. And I have identified three topics, uh, research, the quality and efficiency of work. So for, for, for tax lawyers and also uh, the evaluation of, of tax policy. And if you allow me, I want to jump in in each topic um, in a row. They, for research, so that's a bit uh, for my work or the work of my students, uh, is one thing so we can subdivide that in searching for information. Um, so um, if we um, have a type of comparative um, 
taxation. Uh, you know that, Jesslyn, from your lecture in Mannheim, you see tables with uh, tax rates, tax bases around the world, and we collect that data from databases. Say, with an uh, AI, you just pose a question and, and extract the data I, 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 I want to have. So that's, that's one thing. Or you have um, a document of, of, a, of a tax reform, and the document, the tax amendment law, might have 200 pages. And if you ask, you know, you, you must ask the right questions. What are the major tax changes in this paper? And you get that maybe on one page. You don't need to read 200 pages, right? Um, or you get, uh, if you get a new government, say in the United States, the, the, the new president, Donald Trump, and, and he releases a program of his policy, right? And you might pose the questions, what is the position of the new government towards the taxation of the very rich or the poorer household? So you get extremely fast, uh, reliable information. And then regarding research papers, um, so for the PhD students, right? Um, the only information which is used in empirical work today is data from financial accounting and from the capital markets because that's that that data is is available in structured formats but there are really relevant additional information which could increase the you know the quality of research so uh use more information. The ownership structure, is it a family business? Is it a listed company? Or um, the age of a company? Uh, is it mature? Is it a startup? So, so what, you know, what are the features of this company? The ownership, uh, the, the, the composition of the management board. You could ask gender, you could ask diversity, you could ask age, you could ask former positions, right, which might have an impact, but you don't know the pattern um, yet, or you take the style of the reporting language. Is it either aggressive or is it not aggressive or the quality of information, the information which is provided, is it copy paste or is it more accurate? So uh, a lot of things we can uh, think of. Second, quality and efficiency of work that, that relates to uh, the tax accounting firms. Um, if you think of a, you know, a big deal, merger and acquisition, you, you, you buy a group of companies and you pay $5 billion. Then what, what you have to do, you have to access um, the tax risks in, 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 in the target company uh, by uh, a due diligence. And without AI, the due diligence is done in a data room where you get all the information uh, unstructured. You know, you, you get papers, papers, papers. And um, if you use AI uh, and have the, the, the right prompts, the right questions, okay, what would an assessment ask? And, and then you scan the, the document. So you get really the low hanging fruits. Uh, you save time and you have an increased quality of your work. The last topic is tax policy. Say, um, if there is a change in the tax law, you may ask, what are the reactions of the taxpayers and, 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 and what are their characteristics? No, which taxpayers react and, and, and which not? So that's really then you, you have a better evidence-based, you know, um, tax policy. So these are the things I, I made up my mind and I, I, I'm 100% sure that there are even more uh, topics or examples uh, which come up in the future. If I may summarize, so I see, um, say, a major part of um, um, artificial intelligence in extracting better information more information and the, the technique is post the right questions to the data you have. Okay. Thank you, Professor. That's a very comprehensive view. So one of my questions would be, you know, a lot of people want to do online selling in Facebook or they do online selling in TikTok, but then in what ways do we 
tax this because it's in the internet. How does that work? Yeah, good question. You could also uh, say to, you could access the questions to to all electronic marketplaces, uh, gambling, uh, eBay, and so on. And one feature of these electronic marketplaces or platforms mm -hmm. is you don't pay in cash, right? So you pay by credit card or you pay by PayPal or any other, you know, electronic uh, device. And I, I discussed that with um, um, people from uh, information system because I'm a tax man and I'm not a technic. But I have heard about the blockchain technology, okay, that you can access data like the transactions on your credit card and you access only the data you're allowed to access. And, and then you can control for that. Uh, well, what is the turnover or the profit uh, a platform has made? And um, this information could be provided uh, to uh, the tax administration and, and they can check for that. Um, and I'm pretty well sure that this will work. Say blockchain and thank you, Professor. Device. I just want to ask one question on that because a while ago you're talking about oh, AI is going to help us with the tax rates, everyone's going to know the tax laws. But then, what do you think would be the risk of letting AI help us to analyze this data? The technique uh, of AI uh, mm -hmm. is very powerful, and um, we have. Um, to define really strict rules because it's like a, a self-learning computer, like your brain works. It's like a neural network. That's the technology. And um, we must be sure that the information provided by the use of AI is reliable and not a fake news. And, 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 and you see how, how fast the technology develops. It develops every quarter of a, of a, of a year. And, and so we have to be aware um, that I, AI, the technology, is in a position to think by its own. So, and and that's, that's not only a risk related to, 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 to uh, taxation, that's a risk for, say, the, the whole society. Uh, and we talk for many years now about fake news. So how reliable is the information provided? What are the data sources used by the technology? So this is really um, something where we should define clear borders. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor. So uh, as we're touching down to the end of the of our little podcast episode, we wanted to play a little game with you. So basically how it works is you're going to have one minute to answer as many questions as you can. And they're very simple questions. So for example, is uh, uh, do you prefer pizza over pasta or what's your favorite movie? Those kind of questions. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Yeah. So Professor, you're Just ready? Then. Okay. So first is what's yep. your favorite board game? Okay, my favorite ball <laughs> game is basketball. What's your favorite dessert? Uh, What's ice your cream. biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve. Uh, pork. If you're famous, what would you be known for? Okay, aside from taxing, taxation, everybody taxation. knows you're a tax superstar in the EU. So aside from taxation, what else would you be famous for? Um, <laughs> a critical person. If you could own any animal as a pet, what would it be? Really? A cat. I thought you have a cat already. Oh. I have no pet. So uh, we had dogs. We had um, dachshund when I was uh, okay. a kid. Okay. Okay. Well, time's up. <laughs> Thank you again, <laughs> Professor, for being here. Before we leave, where can people reach out to you? Is there any research or things you want to promote? There are interesting things going on in the world. Um, say, uh, I think the most uh, a political topic is uh, to to find a new um, global tax order to have uh, minimum taxation around the globe. 
to have more transparency. To, that means to disclose more information uh, by by multinational companies. So there is really something going on in, in, in our world, and it will be interesting to see who will follow. Say it's the EU. What is about the United States? What is about China? And and this is an interesting process. Um, Thank you, Professor. And before we leave, I just want to ask this because you you said something very interesting. You said you hope to have a global minimum taxation rate. You said okay. So who gets to decide what that yes. rate is and how do we plan to implement this? Um, we have already implemented a directive in the European Union. And the minimum tax rate, which should be paid, is 15%. And don't ask me why 15%. I could say 15 is half of 30 uh, or three times five. Um, so that ha has been decided in a, in a political process. But there is no theory behind that. And, and when you say it's implemented to all European countries, it means like, uh, like, all the countries in the EU, so including like some of the countries that are considering, like for example, Luxembourg and those kind of countries, they also are. They also have to align to these uh, rules. Yes. Okay. Have to, it is the philosophy it is for multinational operating in, uh, uh, numerous uh, foreign jurisdictions that it, it's a blended perspective. So in each jurisdiction, say in Luxembourg, in Ireland, in Germany, France, and so on, uh, a multinational operates, the minimum tax it should pay is 15%. Right. And so what we expect is a, it's a bit of an increase, you know, in, 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 in taxes uh, uh, in low tax countries. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> I think we need to say goodbye now. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you again, Professor, and see you guys in our next episode. Goodbye.